Hey guys. The first topic that we're going to study is topic one materials and the atoms. Before we go into the first part of this topic, uh, I just want to talk about what chemistry is all about. Now, chemistry is the study of the infinite variety of materials, both uh, man made and also natural, um, that are present in our world. We know that all materials are composed of a limited number of basic building blocks which we call atoms. Now we've studied in the past about the structure of an atom and what we know is that the structure of the atom is used to help explain the structure of all materials. So as we study chemistry this year we'll be learning about uh, how uh, different types of atoms may combine to form different substances and also look at how they can interact with one another through things like chemical reactions. This leads into subtopic 1.1 which is on properties and the uses of materials. These are going to be the learning objectives for this part of the subtopic and for today's lesson we're going to focus on the first part of this which is to investigate how the uses of materials are related to their physical properties. This is the first science understanding, so just make sure you have a good read through that, but uh, we'll spend today's lesson looking in detail about what this is all about. So to start off, I mentioned before that there are virtually an infinite a number of different types of materials around us and there are new substances constantly being made. Now how we actually use them is based on their specific characteristics and we term these characteristics their properties. This can consist of both chemical and physical properties. Chemical being how those materials react with others and we'll talk about what physical properties are in a moment, but keep in mind this dictates how and where they are used. Physical properties is also known as the macroscopic properties, and the word macroscopic means that it is visible to the naked eye. So these are any types of observations or measurements that uh, can be viewed directly or can be measured, and it doesn't actually change the composition of matter itself. So if we have a look at a few examples, we've got the appearance, the texture of the material, even its color, what it smells like, and these in bold here are what we're going to focus on. And I'll also talk a bit about the density as well. Let's start off with solubility. And solubility is all about how well a particular substance, which we call a solute, is able to dissolve in another substance which we term the solvent. So it's important that you're familiar with these two terms solute and solvent and usually to denote um, the solute it's the substance that is present in the lesser amount and it's the one that gets dissolved by the other substance our solvent. So then by default solvent is what's present in the greater amount and it's the one that does the dissolving. So here's an example and just imagine that we've got uh, a solute like sugar. So we've got a teaspoon of sugar here and we're going to then dissolve that in a common solvent like water. So as we add our sugar into the water and we give it a bit of a mix, it's going to allow the solute particles to evenly disperse throughout the water, um, which is the solvent. And what we notice in this case is that we formed a mixture and it appears as if it's just one substance itself. I'll talk a bit more about different types of mixtures in a later video. The next property, and this is kind of combined with, um, so we've got thermal conductivity here. But it's also combined with electrical conductivity. So the two can actually go quite uh, hand in hand with one another. We'll start off with thermal condu conductivity. So this is how well a material can actually conduct or transfer heat energy. 
And just a few general observations is that we know that metals are generally good conductors of heat, which is why we often see them being used in cookware. Non-metals and gases are usually poor conductors. So an example of a non-metal material is something like rubber or plastic. I've got a series of diagrams that show you how a metal can actually conduct heat uh, relatively well. So you can see the atoms that make up the metal here, and they're arranged in this repeating structure. We supply heat to a section of our metal. We're going to get the atoms closest to the heat source, becoming excited, and when they do that, they uh, can actually uh, vibrate more, their kinetic energy increases, so they vibrate more, and those vibrations can then be transferred to the surrounding atoms. Now because we've got a metal here, which is a good conductor, this means that it allows the metals um, and the atoms to vibrate and to transfer that energy quite readily between neighbouring atoms. So in contrast, a poor conductor would not allow for the transfer of energy and the transfer of kinetic energy as well as something like a metal. So we wouldn't expect this to happen um, at uh, a similar rate. It can still happen, but maybe not as quickly. Electrical conductivity is just about how well a material can conduct or transfer an electric charge. And again, we find the same characteristics. So metals are generally good conductors of electricity, so we can find them in our household wiring. Non-metals and gases are usually poor conductors. So again, plastics and rubbers we can often find as insulators to help protect wiring. The next property we're going to talk about is the melting and boiling point. And so this is something that you've studied in the past. And it's looking at changes of states. So the melting point is about the point when you get a substance changing from a solid to a liquid state. And because we're talking about the melting point, it's really the temperature at which this occurs. So we know that, for example, water has a melting point of zero degrees Celsius. So that's where it changes from solid ice to liquid water. The boiling point, however, it's explained a little bit differently because there's another term that we come across which is called evaporation, and these two often get confused between one another. The boiling point does represent a change in state, going from a liquid to a gas, but the important point in this case is the fact that you have to get a boiling of the liquid itself. And that means that the liquid needs to form these bubbles or pockets of gas throughout the liquid itself. The word evaporation, it can mean a change in state from a liquid to a gas or a vapor, but a few differences is that it can occur at any particular temperature, and it's something that only occurs on the surface of the liquid itself. So an example would be to look at a shallow dish filled with water, and you can leave it out in the sun on a hot sunny day and you come back a couple hours and you might find that all the water has actually disappeared or at least part of it has. So that would be what we'd term evaporation. Whereas boiling, we know that water has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. So only at that temperature will you get this boiling phenomenon and the liquid forms these pockets of gas throughout the liquid and turns into a gas or a vapour. This diagram just shows you the uh, temperatures at which water can actually change state. So if you have a look here, you can see that below zero, water exists as a solid state, as ice. And then when it starts to melt, you actually get uh, a, a phase change. So the temperature doesn't actually change as the state is changing from solid to liquid. And then once it's turned into liquid, that's when the temperature starts to increase as we're adding heat. 
and we will get that to the point where it reaches its boiling point, which is 100 degrees Celsius. And so we get that sort of combination of liquid forming those bubbles of gas. And when all of that has actually formed, we then create steam, which is the gas form of water. So these flat sections represents where the matter, in this case water, is changing phase or changing state. The last one I want to talk about is density because this is a key property that can actually make materials different. And over to the left you can actually see we've got this picture of a cylinder containing several different liquids and you can, say, you can see that they're forming different layers and we've just coloured them differently. You, can, you might be able to find that there are different objects embedded throughout. And how we can get this occurring is by looking at differences in the density of different solids and liquids. The density of a substance is it's a fraction and it's looking at the mass of a substance in a given unit of uh, volume or in a given volume for that substance. We've got a formula that we can use to work out the density but I'll talk about the units first. So the units for mass we generally express them in grams the volume is normally represented in cubic centimetres, but for liquids we can normally write that down as mils. And we can say that one cubic centimetre is equal to one mil. If we look at the equation, the density, and it's this symbol here, it's a Greek symbol which we um, call rho, it's equal to the mass divided by the volume. So the mass per volume. If we carry out this calculation using the same units, we can then compare the densities of various solids and liquids. So that's the end of uh, this first video, looking at properties and in particular physical properties of different materials. We'll elaborate this further in class, but for now, uh, thanks for your time and uh, we'll see you next time.